Now, look at this. I'm calling it a collared cam because I don't know what its real name is. I'm counting on someone telling me and I'll update the title of this video. I made this once I'd fully realized what an amazing thing it is. It's not that complicated and it's easy enough to make with a CNC plasma cutter. The inner plates can spin freely around inside a race of bearings. So what's so amazing about that, Tim? Well, I'll tell you, but let me first take you back a bit. You know what, I've made this big wheel and the plan is to drive it with a belt around the outside from my old engine. And if that works, then I'll have a heavy wheel spinning relatively slowly, but with lots of torque. Now, originally my plan was to put a circular plate onto the outside of the spokes. Here's just a template of part of that. And then have a hopper set close to it, but not quite touching. And then add a simple blade to the plate. And the blade would run down between the spokes and the hopper, breaking up the charcoal and pushing it through a slot at the bottom. Simple, and I'm sure it would still work. But before I even got that far, I was making the wheel and I realized how powerful it's likely to be. So I expanded the plan to include breaking up logs too. Not just the charcoal, breaking up logs using teeth on the spokes. My aim is to reduce logs to the size of kindling so they'll dry easily and I can make them into charcoal. I don't want really small pieces because they're too difficult to dry before they turn into compost. And I don't want big logs because they took too long to dry and they take too long to cook. So I was thinking that a few short teeth might rip the log into fibrous lumps and do it quickly. So I experimented for a while with that idea. I thought maybe high tensile bolts might work as the teeth. They'd be mounted at 45 degrees and bite maybe an inch into the log with every rotation. Once they're sharpened, of course. I'd only need a few of them. They wouldn't all hit the log at the same time. Arranging them in an arc should make it easier on the wheel and each consecutive tooth would break open the log a little more until a long piece falls out of the way at the bottom. And then the teeth would go round and one second later, they come back and take some more off. This is the side view. Now that was the plan, it was quite a good plan, but I didn't get very far with it because I realized that it would only work with small logs. Logs thin enough to crack right through as soon as they are hit by the tooth. A big log, or halfway through a big log, would probably be too much for the tooth to get through, unless it was only scraping away at the edge of it. And if the tooth couldn't get all the way through, then something else would have to happen instead. I don't know what damage stopping the wheel suddenly would do, but I'm hoping I'll never find out. So I moved on from separate teeth as a plan to a single knife blade, similar to my log chomping machine, but designed to take slices off the side of a log. I used one of the experimental blades from that machine and just recut it to line up with existing bolt holes. I stop, that's not actually the right one. What? <laughs> well, it's that, it's that one and that one. Is it? I think so, isn't it? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Let's just check that. <laughs> now, this bit, sharp enough for now. Let's see what that looks like in there. We spent a while trying to work out how to support there. the logs. Pull this towards me, isn't it? But at least it can get past. If it goes wrong, you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. The whole thing's wobbling by the way. Isn't it? No. Tim cleaning. <laughs> Tim, what are you doing there? <laughs> I can't remember. I think it's come back to me from a long time ago. Long, long time ago, yeah. Will and I set up a feed hopper with the idea that the whole yeah, we'll long log could be fed in like a pencil into a sharpener. And so if I can just slide this in, once it's spinning. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> that was a bit gentle. <laughs> okay. Woohoo! It's it's because it's it's the angle of the blade is too close to the angle of the wood, isn't it? Yeah. It's not grabbing it. The, it's not the angle, of, it's the angle of the, the bevel on bevel, the blade. Yeah. So I reground the blade and installed it the other way around so it's more like a sickle shape. And that showed much more promise. Of course, this is just an experimental bodge up, okay, to see what will happen. You don't need to point out all the faults in this experiment, okay? Nice. Now, That's but perfect. the trouble is, when it gets to a little narrow bit, that gets stuck in there, and this is what happens. Beep. It wedges itself between the frame and the blade. So that not going to work. I think I could have sorted this out one way or another, but then, I, <laughs> oh dear, then I decided on a whole new approach. I've decided to take all the cutting and the slicing and the grinding action away from the spokes, away from the wheel altogether, and set them up outside the wheel's perimeter. They still be powered by the wheel though, via a crankshaft. So now instead of a circular motion, the forces will be changed into a reciprocating linear motion. Instead of going round and round, some sort of blade would go back and forth. Still at 60 times a minute, still with all the force available from the engine. Now I'm still thinking about exactly what those machines would look like. The plan is still to grind up charcoal and split open wood, but exactly how is still in question. Because... Before I can get that far, I need to get this crank working to drive the con rod, connecting rod. And there's a major challenge with crank design. This handle is a crank. This was just a temporary thing we knocked up to get the wheels spinning, but it illustrates the challenge. The crank arm is attached at one end to the main wheel shaft and to a secondary shaft at the other end, in this case a handle. The handle is at 90 degrees to the arm and allows rotation in itself, but also rotates around the first shaft. Where it's attached to the center shaft is a major challenge because that shaft is only a couple of inches across. So all the power in this huge wheel is coming through this small area and a very strong joint has to be made. I don't have a suitable big cast iron crank handle, of course, and we don't have scrap yards anymore in Ireland for some bizarre reason, so there's slim chance of me finding what I need. But perhaps I could make something. I could grind off flat faces in the shaft and bolt something solid on. Although my experience with my log chomper showed how easily bolts can shear off in exactly these situations. Huge forces concentrated into a tiny area breaks things and welding this sort of steel requires a bigger welder than I have but anyway that's the easy end of the crank arm the other end needs a shaft sticking out at 90 degrees and this time instead of a hand it would have the connecting rod attached to it so now the forces are not just trying to stop the rotation 
they're trying to get rid of that whole 90 degree bend thing altogether. The forces will be trying violently to break off that handle or at least twist it sideways. Now the way people get around this is by using another crank arm. That way both sides of the handle are supported which makes a big difference. But I'd need to cut the shaft in two to leave a gap for the con rod to pass through. But that would mean adding more support for the short shaft, another pair of bearings basically. And the same thing would happen if I tried to mount this crank handle somewhere out along the spokes. It would be easy to make it strong because it could be supported right through the wheel. But of course, if you attach a con rod to it, then you couldn't rotate the wheel because the main shaft would be in the way. So, aha, finally we get all the way back to where we started with this thing. This center disc is the equivalent of the crank arm. So the center shaft goes in this hole and the yep. disc no. rotates around it in an eccentric mm -hmm. manner, just like the crank arm. So far much the same as our wooden crank handle, mm -hmm. but what makes this so wonderful is the con rod, the connecting rod is attached to this outer ring and never has to cross the center shaft. And that means that the twisting forces on the handle are no longer there and the shaft doesn't need to be cut in two. I don't know who invented this because I can't look it up because I don't know its proper name, but whoever it was, was a genius, pure genius. Now I could attach it to the shaft out here, but I'm going to move it back inside this bearing where I can attach it to the spokes, which will give it more support. That's the plan, but to do that, I'll need to lift the whole wheel off its frame. So I'll wait for some help for that. Okay, people, I hope I didn't bore you with all that. I just thought you were owed a fuller explanation of the wheel and what I'm trying to do with it and the reason everything takes so long. I'm asked all the time why I'm not working on the railway or a steam engine or whatever. And where's the next video? All I can say is I'm doing my best, okay? <laughs> what with all the other farm jobs that need doing, I rarely get more than three or four hours in the workshop on any one day and the videos themselves often take days to make. So be patient. And as I often say to people who nag me in the comments, if you want me to go faster, just send money, lots of money, because that usually helps. <laughs> and a final note to all of you who encourage me to be clear and accurate and who tell me off when I'm not, I have avoided getting into the difference between cams and cranks. But as I understand it, and of course I'm just a beekeeper who's learning mechanics as fast as he can, as I may well be wrong, but as far as I understand, a crank converts linear motion into rotational motion, and a cam does the opposite. So, I hope you like my new collared eccentric cam, or is it a crank? <laughs>